thanks to Connor for sending me the questions. I just got them on Sunday night. So I hope this is still helpful. Um, if you are asked to identify extrema, it's the same thing as if they say find the max and min, or if they say find the critical points, or if they say find the turning points, or if they say find where the tangent to the curve equals zero. All those things mean the same thing. And what they mean is we're going to start with the derivative of our function. And that is 3x squared minus 18x plus 24. We're going to set that equal to 0. And we're going to divide everything by 3 because it does. And that's going to make it easier to work with. We can do that because the right-hand side is 0, the 3 just disappears, and we don't need to keep it in as a common factor. Now we're going to break down 8 into two factors that add up to minus 6, so if I make them both negative, that will work. And I have x minus 2 times x minus 4 equal to 0. Let's squeeze it in there. That gives me two roots, x equals 2 and x equals 4. So those are my two possible extrema. Um, and so that's step one, OK? So when it says find the intervals on which f is increasing and the intervals on which f is decreasing, um, what we could do there is use the second derivative test. So this would be part two of the steps that they're outlining. So if we did the second derivative test, what that's going to do is tell us if we have max or mins um, for those two points. So that's going to make it easier to find increase and decreasing. So we're going to also um, we're going to put in our x equals two value. So that's going to be 6 times 2 is 12 minus 18. That's negative 6. Therefore, 2 is a max value. And I'm suspecting that if we put in 4, we're going to get a positive. And that's going to give us a min. And so that just tells us that we are increasing for negative infinity to 2. Um, we are decreasing for 2 to 4. Oh, yeah, it was 2 and 4. OK. And then we are increasing again from 4 for the rest of the graph. OK, for question 3, find where the graph of f is concave up and where it's concave down. So that was the second derivative test that we learned last week. We're going to go back to our second derivative. And we are going to set that equal to 0. And that means there's only going to be one place where that happens. That's where x is equal to 3. And we talked about that. Um, people who were in last week, we talked about the fact that it's always the half halfway point between your max and your min. OK, and so um, if we test our second derivative, before and after that value, because we know it's equal to 0 when x is equal to 3, then we could try something like um, 2.5 if we want. And I think that the way the prop is writing it is all values to the left. And then after that, all values to the right of our inflection point, because that is our inflection point here. And so any value to the left of x equals 3, such as 2, 
uh, well, 2 is no good because that's going to give us a 0. So let's try like a 2.5 or something. So we could do 6 times 2.5, and that would give us, um, oh, wouldn't that give us 18? No, 15. So that would give us 15, which is just all we care about is positive. Therefore, the graph is concave up before it hits the inflection point. We already know the answer to the next one, but if we try one bigger than three, like um, three and a half, then we're going to end up with 21 minus 18, and that's a positive value. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake here. 15 minus 18 gives us a negative value. I was just doing the 6 times 2.5 there, so it comes out to negative 3. And here it's positive, so this is concave up, and this one was concave down, because it's negative. Okay. All right, so question four. We'll start a new screen for the other questions, but I just thought we would do this one on the screen. Uh, sketch the general shape of the graph of f, and then the next part is plot some specific points such as your local max and min and inflection points and so on. And so if we want to sketch the graph based on what we've learned so far, then we are centered around small values of x because that's where our max and min values are. We know at 2 something happened, we know at 4 something happened, and so now we just have to draw it so we can see what happened, and I hope I've put enough on the y-axis. At x equals 2, we know that we have a max. The original function was x cubed, minus 9x squared plus 24x. So if I put a 2 in there, I get 8 minus 30, what is that, 9 times 4, 36, plus 48. And that's 20, I believe. So at 2, we're going to go up by 5s, I guess, on our y, because we want this to be 20, because that's going to be our max point right there. And then, if I put in the value of 4 and do this all over again, 4 cubed is 64, minus 9 times 4 squared, so that's 9 sixteenths, so that's 144, plus 24 times 4 is 96. And so when we do the math on that one, that's going to be negative um, 80 plus 96, so 16, not too bad. So at 4, I have a max at uh, positive 16, I believe. So that's going to be about there. That's a min, sorry. Okay. Um, we can find our y-intercept pretty easily. We just have to set our original function equal to 0. So if we go back to that, we set all those x's equal to 0, then we have just 24 left over. So that's our y-intercept. So we're crossing the y-axis just... Um, now that doesn't make sense because that's going to be... My apologies, don't do math early in the morning. Uh, here's our original function. And so if we set that equal to 0, we're going to get a, a y-intercept of 0 and an x-intercept of 0. So that just gives us one more point at the origin that we can add. And of course, we know our inflection point, which we're going to label in a minute. And so if we graph this based on what we've found out so far, then Here's what our graph will look like. It's going to come up, and it's going to get to the max and turn around. That's why we call it a turning point. Then it's going to come down, it's going to go through its inflection point at 3, and it's going to go to our minimum point at 416, and then it's going to turn around and go up forever and ever. And here we'll put an arrow for forever and ever. When it asks you to label points, you need to put in your coordinates 
And we also have one more point, remember, we knew the inflection point because we worked that out. And that's always the halfway point between the max and the min. And that point is 3. And the y value for that one would be uh, 27 minus 81 plus 72. So 27 plus 9. No. 27 minus 9. I wish I had a calculator. I think it's, I don't know what it is. I'll let you work it out. Um, okay, and our intercepts, of course, are both the same at 0, 0 here. So we should mark that as well. And that's all we know about this particular graph. That's all we would know about a polynomial graph, really. Um, and uh, so I would say that's done. For problem two, we're just being asked to identify um, the intervals um, after we've identified the points of inflection. So that one's a pretty straightforward and simple one. Um, if I'm reading it correctly, let me just move this. I think I got it right. I think it's x to the 4 minus 12x cubed plus 8x plus 4. And the fun part is that we want to go to the second derivative to do all of our work for this. So it's going to break down this polynomial into a smaller degree polynomial, which is great because that's going to make it a lot easier to work with. Uh, 4x cubed to begin with minus 36x squared plus 8. And then we do y double prime, and that is 12x squared minus 30. Nope, minus 72. Okay, there we go. So that is the function that we want to work with. The first thing we're going to do is set it equal to 0. And then factor. And so I can do a 12x times x minus 6 here. And I'm going to get two possible inflection points. One is x equals 0, and the other is x equals 6. And so because those points make the second derivative equal to 0, then they're both going to be our inflection points. And then we're going to do from 6 to positive infinity, just like that right here. Okay, that's positive infinity, that should be a comma. And so, if we do um, it values before x equals 0, such as, let's say, negative 1, and we put that into our second derivative, then that's going to give us negative 12 times negative 7, that's going to give us a positive value, which makes the function concave up. All I'm doing is just subbing a number into the factored form to make the math easier. Between 0 and 6, we can figure out what's happening there because we're going concave up. Then we hit 0, and that's an inflection point, so it's going to change. So probably it's going to change to concave down, I'm thinking. Um, let's put a 1 in there and see what happened right after 0. So if we put a 1 in, we get 12 times 1 is 12. And in the bracket, 1 minus 6 is negative 5, so that's a negative value, just as we suspected. And then we're going to pass through the point x equals 6, and it's going to change again. So let's find out what it changed into. So after 6, let's try 7. We would get 12 times 7, 84, times 7 minus 6 is 1, so that's going to be a positive value again. So we're going from concave up to concave down and back to concave up again for our graph. And so all points of inflection are fine. That's what these guys are, points of inflection. And then 
thank you guys for coming to Zen. It was just Zen. And then I was tired. And you could be a fun, sweet friend of Joe's for the next time. Thank you. Up for this interval and this interval and Kanku down in this interval. Just like we have all your questions next. And so this is how school is used when we come up against a problem that start with number three. If we wanted to find the limit the easy way, we would just start by plugging in that x value. So if I'm going to put in 5 times 1 to the 4 minus 4 times 1 fourth minus 1 over 10 minus 1 minus 9 times 1 cubed. What happens is on the top I'm going to get 5 minus 4 minus 1, which is 0. And on the bottom, I get 10 minus 1 minus 1, and that's also 0. And I end up with 0 over 0, which doesn't tell us anything about the limit of this function. So with L'Hopital's rule, what we're allowed to do is take the derivative of the top and the bottom individually. I'm going to take the first derivative of that function in the top. And then I'm going to take the derivative of the function in the bottom. And then try finding the limit again. So in this case now, I'm going to have 20 minus 8, which would be 12. And in the bottom, I'm going to have 1 minus 27. And that's um, oh, minus 1 minus 27, so that's negative 28. And so it turns out that we can take the derivative of this guy after all. And that in lowest terms, it's 3 over 7, negative 3 over 7. And so L'Hopital's rule has uh, allowed us to find a limit when at first it looked like we had no chance of being able to find that limit. So we can see in question 4 that the question is going to be slightly different because they're bringing back e to the x. And so we have limit, not lime, limit of e to the x over x. And if x is approaching 1, everything would be fine, but x is approaching infinity. So if we try our little um, procedure of just subbing in the value to find the limit, we end up with e to the infinity over infinity. And that's basically infinity over infinity and doesn't really give us a definable answer. So this time we'll try using L'Hopital's rule and we can keep going on L'Hopital's rule if we think we're going to get somewhere. But every step that we do is really just individually um, taking the derivative of the top and the bottom of the function. And so let's try it. Let's do um, limit as x approaches infinity. Uh, derivative of e to the x is e to the x, but now it's over 1, so that's just e to the x, so that's kind of neat. And so now if I let x approach infinity, it's going to be e to the infinity, which is still infinity. So that is not a defined value, so we still don't have a value. And we can see what's going to happen, right? e to the x never dies. It's always going to be its own derivative. So without a chain rule or any other part of a function um, in this question, we're just going to be doing this forever and ever. That's what infinity means. And so <laughs> it's, we're going to be wasting our time because there's no way we're ever going to get a derivative of L'Hopital's rule or not um, for this function. And so that's where we hang up our hat and say it does not exist, OK? And I think that's it for the questions for this week. But if you have more questions, send them to me. I'm actually home today, so I can take a look and get them back to you pretty fast.